What kind of timeline are we looking at? How long has this been going on? This is That's happening. That's a very good question. This, Let me you know, give you some answers on this. Because I had the privilege just today to listen to Professor Ian Plymer, one of the world's foremost geologists, Professor Emeritus at the University of Melbourne, now Professor Regnant of uh, Mining Geology at the University of Adelaide. And he gives a masterly presentation where he takes you back to the formation of the Earth four and a half thousand million years ago. And he describes the enormous changes in the climate that have taken place since then. Let's come back just to something a bit closer to our own time. Since about 600 million years ago, the temperature has been warmer than the present nearly throughout those 600 million years. It's been warmer than the present in each of the last four interglacial warm periods over the past 600,000 years. And in the present warm period that began 11,400 years ago, we can tell that from measurements of ice cores that are stratified and go all the way down by the years. And you can literally count what the temperature was by measuring the ratio of different isotopes of oxygen in the, uh, trapped in the, uh, in the air in the ice. So we can, we can work out that 11,400 years ago, it began to become warm. And between seven and 8,000 years ago, it was three or four Celsius degrees warmer than the present. It was warmer than the present again in the Minoan warm period that led to the great uh, civilization at Knossos on Crete, which then was eventually brought to an end by the volcanic eruption at Santorini, which once again ushered in a cold period. Then we had another warm period uh, in Roman times, which led to the flowering of the Roman civilization. Then we had another warm period in medieval times, which led to the flowering of the Middle Ages civilization. All the great cathedrals of Europe were built. They were growing uh, grapes in Scotland, all the way up to Adrian's Wall. You certainly can't do that now. They were burying their dead at Valse in Greenland. The Vikings were in the Middle Ages. And that burial ground is under permafrost to this day. And what I'm doing here is doing exactly what you say. And you're quite right about this point. I'm putting it in the perspective of time. And when did the present warming begin? Actually, it began in 1695. We know why it began. It began because there'd been 70 years with virtually no sunspots. And then gradually the sun began to recover its activity. And as it did so, so the world began to warm up. And between 1695... And 1735, in a period of 40 years, according to the oldest instrumental temperature record in the world, which is the Central England temperature record, the temperatures in Central England, and by implication, probably something like this happened throughout the rest of the world, rose by four Fahrenheit degrees in 40 years, the equivalent of roughly nine or 10 Fahrenheit degrees in a century. And yet the entire warming of the 20th century about which all this fuss is being made was not 10 Fahrenheit degrees. It wasn't four Fahrenheit degrees. It was just over one Fahrenheit degree. That's what all this fuss is about. And so you're quite right. The moment we put this in any kind of historical context, we see what nonsense it is to assume that the main driver of the climate today is the tiny addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere of two parts per million per year, which is all that we're able to achieve. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, is there a way for people to go to scienceandpublicpolicy.org and download a copy of the treaty? Yes, indeed they can. They'll get a copy of the original version because I haven't yet managed to get a copy of the latest draft in electronic form. I have it in paper form. Uh, but we are working on that. I'm talking to the UN about it tomorrow. I had to battle like mad to get a paper copy of the, of the new version of the treaty. Because when I went to the document distribution center in the conference center here in Copenhagen, the librarian took one look at me and she said, oh, no, there's no such thing as a negotiating text. What do you think this is? I said, this is a conference which is negotiating the text of a treaty. I therefore require to see the negotiating text. And she looked completely baffled and went to consult her colleagues and they all came back scratching their heads and they said, we don't know, we've never heard of such a thing as a negotiating text, a negotiating draft. No, 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 this isn't about a treaty at all. And I said, look, I'm going to come back in a few moments. I've got to go away and do a television interview. When I come back, I expect to be given a copy of that treaty without further argument or prevarication or excuses or delay. And if I don't, then as a member of the House of Lords in good standing, I am going to make a very loud diplomatic incident about how secretive the UN is being in keeping from the people the true contents of this treaty. 
Would you share and with, would so, you share with so the I went away and did the interview and I came back and they said, well, we have got a kind of very large pile of papers that we do hand out to people. And they gave me this stack about two inches thick, about a thousand pages. And I began looking through some it was mainly rubbish. But right at the bottom of the stack, the last 20 or 30 pages, that was the draft treaty. And they had even tried to hide it from me when they eventually realized they were going to have to give it to me. And this is exactly the same as they had hidden it. The way they hid the first draft of the treaty, they put it on their website. But it was entitled, Note by the Secretariat of the States Parties to the Convention on Climate Change. It didn't mention that this note had, was only two pages long, had a huge treaty, 186 pages long, attached to it. That's how they hid it. Why did they put it up on the website at all? Because you know the game as well as I do. What they were going to do is they were going to spring this horrifying world government on us, get all the, the member states to sign up. If the treaty is long enough, you'll find the negotiators just don't bother to read it from the member states. They'll sign anything, basically, once they come to one of these jamborees and are given enough to eat and drink by the, the host government. And once they've signed it, then, <laughs> of course, they look at what they've signed and say, oh, my God, how did we ever sign this? And then the UN just smarmily says, well, of course, you could have looked at the draft on our website at any time. But, of course, you'd never have found it if you'd looked for it. Can you share with the audience who would never ask you directly, what is the House of Lords? What makes somebody a lord? Can you give people a context? Yes, certainly. The House of Lords is one of the most ancient legislative bodies in Britain. It's actually older than the House of Commons. And it was originally composed of the barons, who were the nobles whom the king needed because they owned tracts of land and could raise armies to fight on behalf of the king. And eventually, at 1215 at Runnymede, was signed Magna Carta, by which the king gave a large amount of his authority to the nobles. And then gradually, over the succeeding centuries, the House of Commons, which was elected, gradually acquired more and more authority. And then uh, in 1906, the House of Lords was stripped of its ability to vote at all on bills to do with um, taxpayers' money. And then in 1949, it was no longer allowed to oppose any bill that the Commons sent up to it for more than six months. It could impose a six-month cooling-off period, but it couldn't ultimately stop the Commons passing any legislation. And then in 1999, the House of Lords, um, many of whose members were at that time hereditary, as, as I would become at that time, my father was a member of the Lords, um, lost the right to sit or vote. And I no longer have the right to sit or vote in the House of Lords, though I am a member of it. I am a peer of the realm. So it's a rather strange, I'm a kind of constitutional throwback, if you like. I'm a piece of political archaeology um, <laughs> in, in practical terms. But the great thing is that a title still conveys with it a certain authority which one can exploit when explaining to people things which the House of Commons and the elected government and the appointed lords who are now appointed by the Prime Minister of the day no longer convey. I have, if you like, on a good day, more authority, more access to the minds and hearts of the people than the appointed lords who are merely the poodles of the establishment in the House of Commons. Got it. Very interesting. Uh, I think that I think that you're probably right about that. But I think that for the general population who doesn't understand the House of Lords, what a lord is, what makes someone a baron, how it works, how it was set up, I think that was a good synthesis. My question well, It's a nice bit of history anyway. Yeah, and, and very it good. is one of the most ancient legislative bodies in the world. And also, funnily enough, uh, even when it was largely filled with hereditary peers, it turned out usually to be more democratic than the Commons, because the Commons, as one of our great constitutional theorists, Lord Hailsham, once put it, is an elective dictatorship. Once you've elected the Commons, they dictate for five years. You know, the government of the day has absolute authority as long as it has a majority in the House of Commons. But the Lords would often stand up and speak against the Commons for the rights of the common man when the Commons were getting too much above themselves. And this was because, as hereditary peers, we didn't have to be elected by anyone. We didn't, therefore, necessarily belong to any particular party or take any party whip. We could speak and think and vote according to our conscience in the way that no member of a party ever can. And that gave us a terrific vigor and independence and also a range of ages. There were far more young people who had inherited their title from fathers who died early, for instance, than there were in the Commons. 
So we were a younger house, a more vigorous house, a more active house, uh, in, in many ways.